All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, another Saturday morning coffee with Matt. Uh, glad you're here. Uh, last Saturday in April for 2022 uh, feels more like the last Saturday in March, but uh, it is what it is, and we're uh, we're getting through it. So, uh, uh, speaking of the weather, um, we were looking at the uh, growing degree days chart. Um, I use one that just uh, that the Morton Arboretum sends out on a weekly basis, um, but it's got uh, um, record or uh, um, measurements taken kind of all across the Chicagoland area. So if you remember back a couple weeks ago, we talked about growing degree days and um, it's basically a formulation. It's, it's not really anything that, um, that you need to know off the top of your head at all, but what the growing degree days are, it's a measurement. Um, the, the basic premise is, is that Plants aren't going to start growing until certain things happen weather-wise, soil temperature-wise, etc. Um, so if you think back like a few weeks ago, we talked about grass seed and how uh, both crabgrass as well as uh, like your, your good grass seed, it's going to take about five days of soil temperatures uh, above 50 degrees in order to get the um, uh, crabgrass seed to germinate, things like that. So it, it uses calculations um, similar to that. Um, but what I found interesting is at, uh, at the Morton Arboretum last year, uh, I think the measurement was taken maybe uh, Thursday or so of this week, um, Wednesday or Thursday, something like that. But last year, we were at 142 growing degree days at Morton Arboretum. And uh, this year, we're at 73. So we're literally only halfway there. And it's even more... Uh, um, more off when we look at Rockford, which, you know, we're obviously here at, at the Garden Center, we're probably equidistant between Rockford and uh, the Morton Arboretum and Lyle. Um, our weather patterns tend to be a little closer to what Rockford gets, though, uh, as cold weather dips down out of Wisconsin, things like that. Um, Rockford is only at 48 growing degree days uh, versus 142 last year. So, um, you know, nearly 100 uh degree days difference. What does that mean? It doesn't mean a whole lot. In some regards, it's actually kind of good. Um, some years when things happen too fast, our flowering trees don't bloom as long. Um, sometimes plants wake up a little too early and then get nipped back by frost. I'm uh, cautiously optimistic that um, the I have a kind of a rare magnolia at home that uh, almost every year leaves out and then the leaves are uh, not real uh, frost tolerant and so the leaves come out it's a large leafed magnolia the leaves come out they get nipped back by the frost they turn black they fall off we have to wait for a second flush of leaves if the flower buds were large at the time they get nipped back and so uh, this year it is looking fantastic the uh, leaf buds are emerging they were not bothered at all by the cold weather that we had earlier this week um, and now the 10 day forecast has nothing below 40 degrees, which is actually lovely. Uh, last year we did have some frost around this time, um, but we had warmer temperatures as, as a whole. So this year temperatures all across the board are lower, but the overnight lows look pretty favorable right now. Uh, does that mean you should put your peppers and tomatoes in the ground? No. Um, temperature wise, uh, overnight low wise, uh, I think you'd actually be safe. Um, however, the soil temperatures, because our daytime highs are not very high right now, the soil temperatures have not warmed up to the point where uh, planting a tomato or pepper or anything would uh, do you uh, any good to get it in the ground early. In fact, I think it would actually take you back a few steps. So uh, those plants like warmer soils. They don't want cold, wet soil against the root system. Uh, that causes root rot and all sorts of other uh, issues. So there's no benefit to getting those plants in early. Now, your cold weather stuff, we've talked about that. Perfectly safe to be planting those. Things like onions and potatoes and uh, cabbages and kales, all of those are perfectly safe to be planting outside. Um, of course, it's safe to plant uh, pansies and um, you know, daffodils and tulips that are uh, growing in a pot that were vernalized. Those are safe to plant. All of that kind of stuff's good. And then all of our trees, shrubs, and perennials are safe to plant. They don't mind the cooler soils. Uh, they will be perfectly content with being planted at this time of year. 
In fact, again, in a lot of ways, there's a benefit there to getting those plants in the ground early while the soil is still cool. It allows the plant to wake up a little bit um, more slowly rather than, you know, waking up really quickly, pushing out leaves, and then not having an established root system to support that. So newly planted items are really going to love this kind of weather. Some of the downsides though, we talked about uh, apple scab and some other fungal diseases. You're definitely going to want to be on the lookout for fungal disease issues this year. Try to be as proactive as possible because most fungal issues are uh, better treated as a preventative rather than, um, you know, after the fact. So uh, if you have problems with powdery mildew, if you've got problems with apple scab, cedar apple rust, uh, lawn rust, you know, a lot of those kind of diseases, uh, you're going to want to be on the lookout for those because uh, the weather patterns that we're experiencing now are favorable to the spread of a lot of those uh, fungal issues. So um, yesterday was Arbor Day. Uh, actually, it was the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day, so that's pretty cool. It's our favorite holiday here uh, for good reason, obviously. Um, I was uh, doing a little bit of calculation and trying to figure up um, approximately how many trees we've grown and planted in the northern Illinois area here since we've been in business. So um, some of you are new to us. We've actually, Wasco Nursery was founded in 1925. Um, started about a uh, mile from its current location. Um, a farmer by the name of Lynn Jay started the business and he was growing trees for a windbreak for his own property. Um, this was obviously very, very rural at the time. And uh, he was growing some trees for a windbreak and uh, some of his farmer friends said, hey, you know, we'd like to have some trees for a windbreak on our property too. And so he grew some extra trees and sold them and uh, started a business that way. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the history there. And uh, fast forward to 2022, we have 140 acres of growing fields. Uh, we grow thousands of trees every year. Um, we have our own crews that will come out and plant those trees. We plant for residential uh, clients. We plant for municipal clients. We plant for uh, businesses, homeowners associations, uh, all sorts of stuff. So by my best guess, um, since 1925, we've planted, uh, grown and planted somewhere around 750,000 trees, um, which I think is pretty cool. Um, especially when you look at uh, things like Dutch elm disease killing all the trees in this area and uh, emerald ash borer killing all the ash trees that we had in this area and uh, chestnut blight and a lot of those kind of things. If, if we weren't out, and I use the term we broadly, all of us, you, me, uh, our team and, and everybody else in the area, if we're not replacing those trees, our landscape would look vastly different. So uh, I'm, I'm really uh, happy and proud to be a part of that legacy. Um, and I hope all of you are as well. Um, so today's topic, I figured since it was Arbor Day yesterday, we would uh, talk, uh, we would talk trees. Um, and in particular, I thought that it would be a good week to talk about the uh, ornamental pear tree. So the ornamental pears go by a handful of different names. Calorie pear is sort of a broad group, um, these types of pears. So these are your ornamental, non-edible flowering pear trees. So the calorie pears, uh, they also go by uh, kind of a, a maybe improper term, but Bradford is a specific uh, cultivar of pear, but the Bradford type pears or the calorie pears uh, have been widely planted in the Midwest um, for the last 50, 60 years. Um, so Bradford, uh, the actual Bradford pear, sort of fell by the wayside because it was very prone to storm damage. Um, it had weak branch angles and a dense canopy with a big, heavy, thick leaf. And so in the summertime, you'd get uh, some of these like storm uh, systems that would roll in, microbursts, things like that, and it would just rip these trees apart. But um, as is typical in our industry, um, people said, well, hey, there's got to be a way to solve this. So they started uh, breeding efforts and looking for Bradford type calorie pears that had stronger branch angles. And uh, fast forward, uh, you know, a couple of decades and there's cultivars like Chanticleer um, and Aristocrat and Autumn Blaze and a whole bunch of others. And these pears are um, stronger and better suited to the growing environment here in the Midwest. And so they were very popular. 
Another reason that they were very popular is that they have uh, lovely white flowers in the spring. The entire tree gets covered with white flowers in the spring. Um, it has a, a very dark green glossy leaf that is resistant to scorch and wind and tatter and, and leaf infections and all that. So it just, it really, really looked healthy all season long. So when those leaves emerged in the springtime, they were dark green and glossy. And if you uh, looked at that tree, maybe the first of September, it was still dark green and glossy. And then in the late fall, it would turn bright orange and red. So it's a pretty good tree. The other thing that was nice about it is it didn't have really wide spreading branches. The, the canopy was very upright and narrow, uh, kind of a pyramidal habit. And so that lent itself very well to being planted in parking lots and in parkways and close to people's homes or near a patio or deck because it didn't have wide spreading branches that were gonna grow back into the house or hang over a street or over the sidewalk, things like that. So um, they were widely, widely planted. However, those pears went rogue, and because of uh, various genetic issues with them uh, and cross-pollination, those trees that were thought to have been sterile turned out not to be sterile. And the seeds uh, were eaten by birds and squirrels and uh, chipmunks and things like that and replanted all over the place. And so our natural areas and even some of our unnatural areas, like, a, like an abandoned lot, for instance, um, I was driving on uh, Big Timber Road in Elgin uh, just a couple of weeks ago, right where the uh, kind of the train tracks uh, um, cross the street there. There's an old rail line there. Um, so just, uh, uh, just west of um, McLean uh, a bit. And there's an empty lot. Um, my guess is that it was a commercial property at some point. There's nothing on it right now. It is uh, probably a, at least an acre of solid pear tree seedlings. So um, the, the birds have dropped it in there. They have grown and grown and grown and grown. And now it's just literally a field of pear trees. Um, and you say, well, you know, on an empty lot, at least there's something there. And, you know, probably not wrong about that. But when you look at some of our natural areas, so this morning I walked uh, in the Koran, for, uh, Koran Farm uh, Prairie Preserve, which is uh, right near my house. Um, it's a couple hundred acre uh, preserve. There's some nice woods, there's some oak savanna, and then there's uh, almost 200 acres of prairie. They just burned the majority of that prairie a couple weeks ago in a prescribed burn. And what's left after that, you've got all your little native seedlings uh, and, and plants popping up, which is wonderful. And I love that at this time of year after the burn and the, the rains and you start to get that new life popping up. But the one thing that remains are the pear seedlings. And so I walked across the street this morning and I took a space just roughly. I didn't measure or anything, but just kind of paste it off. It's about 10 by 10. So approximately 100 square feet. And in that 100 square foot box, there were seven pear seedlings. And uh, I think we're gonna post a photo. I just took a, just a simple photo of what that uh, little space looked like in the prairie. Um, so there were about seven seedlings growing. Some of them were almost as tall as me. A few of them were a little bit shorter. And so I just extrapolated that and I grabbed Google Earth and I took a quick measurement of the footprint of the prairie at Coron Farm. It measured out to about 197 acres, roughly. Uh, and so I, I Took that, divided it by 100 square feet and about seven trees per 100 square foot section. And it works out to over 600,000 pears just on that property alone. And those are gonna choke out our native species. They have to be, uh, it's, it's very labor intensive um, because the burn doesn't necessarily take care of all of them. The burn will help um, if the fire gets hot enough it will sort of fry the, uh, the bark and, and cause that seedling itself to die off, but it'll usually re-sprout. So oftentimes what has to happen is uh, manually, people need to go through and cut them down and spray a chemical on them that will kill the root system. So uh, that's a lot about pears. And uh, so my proposition to you uh, is if you've got a pear in your yard, maybe consider removing it. Um, 
there's other good reasons for that as well. There's also a disease going around on parish, which, you know, oddly enough, is, is kind of a blessing in disguise, uh, called fire blight. Fire blight is a bacterial disease that uh, gets into the tree, um, sort of uh, infects the stem of the plant, and prevents the flow of water and nutrients from the root system back out to the leaves, and then the stems die. And when it gets far enough back into the trunk, then the entire tree can die. Um, so it's actually kind of a good thing that that's happening, in my opinion, on pear trees. I know it's never fun to have a, you know, a well-established tree in your yard die, so I, I don't mean to take pleasure in, in others' misfortune. But um, in the grand scheme of things, it's kind of a good thing. But I thought I would talk about uh, trees that are good for replacing pears, because as I mentioned, they had some very good attributes, and there was a lot of reasons why people planted the pear tree that they did. So. Um, I'm going to run through a list of trees. It's uh, raining outside. I kind of maybe hoped we could uh, uh, take a walk outside and show you some of these trees, but most of them don't have their leaves on yet anyway, uh, because as stated earlier, it's been uh, awfully cold here. So uh, things are just starting to wake up uh, here in the garden center tree-wise. Our flowering trees are looking amazing. The magnolias are, are all budding and starting to bloom. The service barrier looking great. The red buds are just starting to crack their color. So uh, starting to be a beautiful time here, but the most of these trees that I'm going to mention today really aren't doing much just yet. Um, but these are, uh, in no particular order, a really nice list of uh, small to moderate sized trees that would be a good replacement for an ornamental calorie type pear. Uh, first on my list is the American Century Linden. So Linden is a native tree here. Uh, linden, in the, if it was in the woods, we would call it a basswood. So if it was just growing naturally, we call it basswood. In the landscape, we call it a linden. I don't know the answer to why that is, um, but that's what it is. So American century linden is a cultivar, so it's a selection of the native tree. And it was chosen for its upright profile. So most lindens are big, nice uh, shade trees. In fact, there's a, a couple of large basswood right across the street from us uh, here in the, um, at the uh, Campton Forest Preserve. There's a couple of nice big basswood there. Uh, but the American Century keeps a very nice upright profile. It gets about 35 to 40 feet high, which is almost identical to, say, a Chanticleer pear. And it gets about uh, 20, maybe 25 feet wide. So uh, almost twice as high as it is wide, which is almost identical to a pear. It has small yellow flowers in the summertime, which have a nice little fragrance to them. Um, and they are a favorite of um, a lot of our pollinating insects. So very good for pollinating insects, lots of bees, butterflies, etc. cetera. Um, the other nice thing about American Century Linden um, is that it is mostly resistant to Japanese beetles. So unfortunately, Linden's basswood are a favorite of Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles will eat the leaves, turn the leaves to almost a lacy type uh, look, and can be fairly devastating. But uh, for whatever reason, American century tends to be resistant to it. So we have a beautiful one planted here at the garden center. We've never sprayed it. Um, you might have a leaf or two or three that have a little minor munching on it, but for whatever reason, the Japanese beetles have come in. They, I guess, taste it I'm like that. They move on for whatever, for whatever reason. So um, really a very nice tree for a parkway. It's a nice tree for the corner of your home. It's a nice tree if you want some shade um, near your deck or patio, but don't want something to grow back into the house. Really good tree for a situation like that. It also turns a, a nice golden color in the fall. So summer flowers, nice shape, uh, hardy, disease resistant, really a good all around tree. Um, next on my list is a service berry called Spring Flurry. So many of you might be familiar with service berry um, as a multi-stemmed, ornamental, large shrub, small tree. And it typically is that. But there is a variety called Spring Flurry um, that is commonly grown as a single stem tree. It, um, it exhibits all the same characteristics as the normal service berry, um, which is white flowers, and uh, they're just starting to, they're not quite even coloring yet. The flower buds are certainly present, but they haven't fully popped open. So they're kind of a tan or off-white color right now. And then they're going to open to a really pretty white flower. The white flowers will be followed by an edible fruit. It's a small um, uh, red turning to blackish or bluish uh, berry, which has a very nice um, flavor to it. It... Uh, 
I would say it tastes similar to a blueberry, not quite as sweet as a blueberry, um, but they're edible for people. They're edible for the birds. The birds absolutely love them, particularly the uh, cedar wax wings, but many of the uh, birds love them. Um, and then it gets a really nice fall color. So orange and red in the fall. So white spring flowers, edible fruit in the summer, uh, orange, red fall color, really a very cool tree. Um, the, uh, another interesting thing um, about serviceberry is the name. Um, so they, serviceberry or Juneberry. So Juneberry refers to the fact that the fruit typically ripens in June. But uh, serviceberry, the, the word service, comes from the fact that um, in the olden days, when uh, someone would pass away in the middle of winter, they would not be able to bury the dead because the ground was frozen. And when the serviceberry started blooming, the ground was thawed out. And that was when they could have the funeral service, thus the name serviceberry. So kind of a cool thing there. Um, another nice tree for, uh, for a replacement for a pear would be a crab apple. Um, there's a few crab apples that have been bred for an upright profile, again, similar to pears. There's been kind of an increased breeding effort in the last, I would say, 20 years um, to have smaller, more narrow trees. Um, that way we can put more trees on, you know, urban and suburban lots. We also have, um, there's been a, I guess, a trend towards putting larger houses on smaller lots instead of smaller houses on larger lots which was the trend, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so some of these narrow trees are gonna fit very well into the urban and suburban environment. Um, ivory spear and ruby spear crab apple are two of them. They're just very nice upright uh, shaped crab apples. So instead of having wide spreading branches, they've got a very uh, upright branch angle. So it keeps a really nice upright profile. They get about 20 feet tall. Ivory spear, as the name suggests, is kind of a white flowering. Uh, Ruby Spear is kind of more of a pinky red uh, flowering crab apple. They both have a small persistent fruit. In crab apples, we use the word persistent to mean that the fruit does not fall off in the fall. So the old fashioned varieties, the fruit would fall off in the fall. You'd have these mushy, uh, rotten crab apples laying in the yard. It would attract bees and wasps and things like that. Um, that is not true of the newer varieties of crab apple that have persistent fruit. So that persistent fruit will remain all winter. Uh, the birds will munch on it when it softens up in the uh, late winter or early spring. So good source of food for the birds and just a really pretty tree all the way around. Um, along with the, the breeding efforts in the crab apples, there's been a lot of uh, both maples and oaks that have been bred for a more upright profile. Of course, maples and oaks are great native trees. They're hardy, they're disease resistant. They provide all sorts of benefits to uh, the insect population. They're pretty to look at, but they can be very large trees, obviously. Um, so there's been some hybrid oaks that have come around in the last 20 years that are really well suited to the suburban environment. Um, there's a handful of them. Crimson Spire, Street Spire, and Regal Prince are probably three of the more well-known varieties. All of these are, uh, they're all hybrid crosses. Uh, most of them are um, a native oak crossed with the English oak. So English oak tends to be very upright and narrow. Um, and so in order to get that upright profile, they uh, crossed the native oaks with that uh, upright variety of English oak. And um, you kind of get the best of both worlds. So you get, like in the case of Crimson Spire, you get a bright red fall color upright profile, strong branch angle. Most of these oaks are going to get around 40, maybe 50 feet tall, but only about 10 to 20 feet wide. Um, again, making them a very suitable uh, pair replacement, but they're also great for parking lot islands, parkways, the corner of your home. Uh, they make a great privacy screen. If you're looking for shade, you know, if you've got a two-story house behind you and, and you want some screening or privacy from, you know, from that home, these oaks are really nice because they can be planted very close together. You know, you could plant them on, say, six or eight foot centers and make a really nice privacy screen or, a sh you know, uh, they're great for shade uh, as well because they do get tall um, without taking up a lot of your yard space. So those are really nice. There's also a maple that's real similar to that called Armstrong. Um, Armstrong gets about 30 to 45-ish feet tall, 15 feet wide. 
Um, Armstrong turns a nice orangey red in the fall. There's also a variety called Armstrong Gold, which is more of a golden orange color in the fall. But both of those are very hardy, very adaptable, uh, very fast growing vertically, but don't get real wide. Um, lovely trees, easy to grow, great for just about any location. Um, Armstrong maple is nice because you can plant it in a little bit lower wetter corner of the yard. You can plant it in a high dry spot. Um, they're really versatile trees, so you could put that just about anywhere. Um, put a couple of flowering trees, a couple more flowering trees on the list. Um, one of them is a, a lesser known variety of magnolia called Galaxy. Galaxy is a hybrid magnolia. Um, really a very pretty tree. It's a cross between a, what's called a Nigra uh, magnolia and a, a Springer eye magnolia. Um, and those two really, um, made, it made a nice cross. Um, the galaxy tends to be a single trunk tree, although occasionally you'll find it grown multi-stem, but we've got some beautiful single stem uh, galaxy magnolias out there. It tends to have a very upright pyramidal habit. Uh, which is not typical of magnolia. So upright uh, profile, um, beautiful bright pinky purple um, with a tinge of white to it, flowers. Um, kind of your bigger saucer type flowers. So it has a big flower. Uh, it's very attractive. Um, it's very hardy and disease resistant and lends itself very well um, to that, you know, to that single trunk uh, profile. Size wise, uh, about 30 tall and 12 to 20 wide or so. Um, so good good one for that. Um, another nice one um, that I like to use in really harsh planting environments or poor soils, things like that, is a Japanese tree lilac called ivory silk. There's also a handful of other Japanese or Peking type lilacs that are um, really well suited to our area. But all of these tend to have a white or creamy yellow-ish flower in late May, early June, which is also a cool time because most of the flowering trees, the magnolias and the serviceberry and the redbud and the crabapple, all of those bloom in late April, early May, and, uh, and then they're done. Whereas the uh, Japanese tree lilacs are going to start blooming in late May and bloom into early June. They bloom for several weeks. It has a nice fragrance to it, although it's not as strong of a fragrance as the shrub lilacs, the old fashioned varieties that you might be familiar with. Um, but it is, it does have a nice fragrance. Uh, big white flowers, uh, fairly large. The other thing that's nice about those flowers is that when they're done blooming, that whole big flower just kind of turns to dust and falls off. So there's no, there's no petals, there's nothing to clean up. Um, it doesn't have any fruit, uh, so it's a fruitless tree. There's technically a little bit of a seed, which um, is, is nothing that really falls off or makes a mess or does anything. So very clean, easy to grow tree. Um, Great for near a home or patio or deck, um, but also lends itself well to uh, parking lot islands and uh, the parkway, things like that. We have a beautiful one planted here at the garden center. Actually, in our back parking lot, there's a little peninsula. It's not really a parking lot island, but a little peninsula that sticks out of the landscape. And we have it right in the center of that peninsula. Um, beautiful tree. That's a multi-stemmed one. We also grow them in a single trunk form, which would be a good pair replacement. Um, another one that's kind of, uh, I guess, a little off the beaten track um, is a variety of Dawn Redwood called Gold Rush. So we have a beautiful Dawn Redwood planted here at the garden center. We do not have a, a Gold Rush planted. Um, but Gold Rush keeps a very pyramidal form and um, has a golden or chartreuse colored foliage during the summertime. So Dawn Redwood's kind of a cool tree. Um, 60 to 100 years ago or so, um, we knew of Dawn Redwood, but we thought, um, or in science, uh, horticulture, whatever, we thought that they were extinct. Uh, we knew about them because of the fossil record, but we had never seen them. Uh, then in the 1950s, I guess it was, um, some explorers in the mountain regions of China rediscovered the Dawn Redwood. And then you fast forward, you know, whatever, 70 something years later, now we have it available to us in the trade again. Uh, beautiful tree, Dawn Redwood is what's called a deciduous conifer. So that means it's a cone-bearing plant, like a spruce or a pine, 
but it's deciduous. Its needles or leaves fall off in the fall, like our maples and oaks and ash and things like that. So it's a deciduous conifer. Um, it has a really pretty shaggy bark and a nice green soft needle, which turns kind of a pinkish or a rust color in the fall. Um, but it gets quite large. But the uh, dawn, uh, the I'm sorry, the gold rush variety with its uh, chartreuse colored foliage has a really nice pyramidal habit. We have one at home planted actually uh, relatively close to the driveway. Um, I would say it's about six feet uh, ish off the driveway. It's probably 20 feet tall at this point and maybe six feet wide. Um, so very, very upright and narrow. Um, really a pretty tree. The uh, coloring on it is fantastic. The texture is really cool and the bark is quite nice. Um, another good replacement if you're looking for a large tree. So. I had mentioned various cultivars um, of the pear, like aristocrat and some of those. Aristocrat was a very large uh, pear tree, um, 40 to 50 tall, 30 to 40 wide. So it wasn't as upright as the Chanticleer and some of those varieties. So if you're looking for a suitable replacement for one of those, um, I would suggest maybe the, uh, the native northern Catalpa. So the northern Catalpa is a, um, is a very large native tree with huge heart-shaped leaves. So really pretty heart-shaped leaves. And in the early summertime, you're going to see these white, um, almost orchid-like clusters of white flowers. Um, they're, they're actually very, very delicate looking and unique. Again, real similar to almost like an orchid, um, but in a cluster. And uh, they're native, they're hardy, they're very fast growing. Uh, they're very disease and insect resistant. Um, they are a large tree, uh, 50 to 70 feet tall, 30 to 40 ish wide. So pretty big tree, but a really good replacement. Um, and the last one that I had on my list is a tree called the tulip tree. It's one of my favorites. We have a lovely one. Actually, we have two of them, I guess, planted here at the garden center. Um, one near the office, one a little bit further away. Both of them are wonderful specimens. Um, in its youth, it keeps a very upright profile. So the profile is uh, kind of an upright oval, slightly pyramidal habit. Um, it's going to get, in the landscape, it's gonna get about 40 to 50 feet tall. Um, in the wild, they can get as big as 200 plus. The reason that I mention that is sometimes I recommend a tulip tree to people or they hear about it and then they look it up online and it says that the tree is gonna get 200 plus feet tall and they're scared off by that. That will never happen in a residential landscape situation. You're never going to see a tree, uh, especially a tulip tree, um, get 200 feet tall in a suburban lot. Even in a uh, maybe in a um, semi-rural situation, you're not going to see them get that tall. Um, the uh, the overall size in the landscape, I would say, 40 to 50 tall, 20, 25, maybe 30 wide after a really, really long time. But that's the other thing that you want to keep in mind is, you know, the the average lifespan of a tree in the landscape is typically going to be a half ish of what it is in the wild. So um, and and then along with that comes half the size typically. So our our homes um, we have lawn, which is not a natural thing. We have uh, people and lawn equipment and all sorts of other stuff compacting the soil on a regular basis uh, underneath our trees. That's not something that happens in the wild. Um, we tend to have uh, singular or individual trees rather than trees in clusters like you might find in the woods. Um, all of those things along with many other um, tend to uh, mean that the tree really just isn't going to uh, thrive quite the way that it would in uh, in its native habitat. Uh, the other thing is that um, our soils tend to have been scraped off when the homes were built and we're lacking bacteria, which um, you've heard me talk about a lot. Uh, whenever we plant a tree, so um, whenever our crews are out planting a tree, we are adding uh, beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungi to the soil in hopes of rebuilding that population. Um, it's not a perfect thing, but it is, um, it is a, a really good way of trying to introduce that biology back into the soil. I do it at home with my vegetable garden. Uh, I do it uh, with flowers and perennials that I plant. And I certainly do it with all the trees that I plant in the ground as well. Um, so it's 
these uh, these bacteria and fungi will uh, do various things. One of them, though, is it sort of forms a symbiotic relationship with the root system and helps the root system kind of fan out and uh, find water and nutrients. So um, it's really a beneficial thing. And um, if we walked across the street into the forest preserve and pulled up a handful of soil and, you know, threw it under the microscope or whatever, we would see that the soil is teeming with life. But when you go in your yard and you cut out a piece of grass and you grab a piece of that soil, there's not gonna be a lot of life left in that soil. And that's one of the reasons why these trees aren't gonna get quite as large as they would in the wild. But that doesn't mean that they won't do well. Um, they can do very, very well in your yard and you can have you know decades of enjoyment out of most of these varieties of trees that we've talked about. So certainly worth planting. Um, Again, this was, uh, you know, kind of a, a little bit of, of me on my soapbox uh, about pear trees. Um, I, I love our native lands around here. I frequent the forest preserves and prairie preserves and all of that kind of stuff in my off time. Um, really love it. And I just, I hate to see our native areas. And, and again, even some of our uh, just, you know, kind of empty lots and, and uh, other areas taken over by the pear trees. Um, there's a, a little kind of wetland um, over near St. Charles East High School, kind of uh, near, there's also um, Redling Middle School, and there's a, an area of pear trees over there that has kind of gone rogue, probably from one of the neighboring subdivisions, and then it's kind of infiltrated into the edges of the wetland and, and that area. Um, right on Route 38, uh, there's the boys' home, the, uh, um, the juvenile detention facility. And just west of that, there's a forest preserve. Part of that, I think it's, uh, I think it's partly county-owned, partly state-owned land. Um, and uh, I was driving by there in the fall, you, you know, second week of November. And so all the native grasses and perennials and all that kind of stuff have, have kind of turned brown and gone dormant. And the only thing remaining are bright fire engine red and orange uh, pear trees. And they're just, uh, you know numerous uh, to say the least. So uh, hopefully this will spur you to take a little action in your own yard if you have a, a pear that needs to be replaced. But of course these are just wonderful tree suggestions. They don't need to replace a pear. Of course they're wonderful trees if you're just looking for something that is uh, fitting for a suburban or urban yard. Isn't going to take up a ton of room but is going to give you some really cool features whether it be flowers, fall color, uh, interesting bark, all of that kind of stuff. So um, there's certainly lots of other options. These were just a handful that I came up with that would be suitable replacements. So I hope that that helps. Um, I hope that uh, you have a wonderful weekend of uh, maybe working in the yard. We got a little rain here and there today. It doesn't look like it's going to be maybe as uh, strong or as frequent as uh, originally predicted. So maybe we'll get a chance to get outside and uh, get a little work done or maybe visit one of these natural lands that I've been talking about. So until next time, have a wonderful day and hope you get outside.